everyone, my name is Mara, and today's case is about Sky Metawala, who was only two years old when he went missing from Bellevue, Washington in 2011. And just a quick reminder before I get started that I try to do the very best research and get the most accurate information I can for every single case that I cover. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into today's case. Guy Elijah Metawala was born on September 6th of 2009 to his dad, Solomon Metawala, who was born in Pakistan, and his mom, Julia Burakova, who is Ukrainian and was born in Soviet Russia. She said while she was growing up that her parents were very abusive and that she was subjected to shock therapy and also in mental hospitals. But Julia and her family moved to the United States when she was 12 years old. In 1997, when Julia was 15 years old, she met 21-year-old Solomon. And they ended up really liking each other and eventually started dating. By 1999, they were living in Bellevue, Washington together. They had got a loan to buy a condo. Solomon was running a convenience store, and Julia was working with his family at the restaurant that they owned. It wasn't all just happiness, though. They were said to fight a lot. There were times where they even got into fights in public and authorities had to be called. She said that Solomon was very controlling of her and that this made her emotionally dependent on him. And then in 2003, it was saying that he was facing deportation for unknown reasons. So they decide then to get married so he doesn't get deported. They have a small ceremony in his mom's kitchen. But even though they decided to get married, this did not fix that they were fighting a lot. And one of the challenges that they then faced was in 2005 when Solomon decided to convert to Christianity. And Julia said she felt as though her in-laws blamed her. They also were facing financial issues because a deli opened up next to the family's restaurant. So all these different things were just building up and seemingly working against them. But in 2007, they ended up having their first child, who was a daughter that they named Molly. They then were able to buy a house in 2008 in Kirkland, Washington. And it said that their mortgage was over $800,000, which also included the payment that they still owed for the condo. But either way, that's a lot of money. During this time, Julia became pregnant with their second child. The doctor prescribed her antidepressants and she said that she did not need them. But on September 6th of 2009, she gave birth to their son, who they named Sky Elijah Metawala. And they were not able to afford their mortgage, so the lenders started to foreclose on their home in Kirkland. They then moved back to their condo in Bellevue. Solomon said during this time that Julia started to show a lot of psychological problems. Julia was becoming so obsessed with keeping their house clean that she would not let them eat inside and that she also made the kids and him sleep on the floor. They also kept getting cited by the city for noise complaints, because it would be after 11 p.m. and Julia would be up vacuuming their house. And during this whole thing, it's a lot of he said, she said, they're both going back and forth. But Julia said that this made Solomon so mad that they kept getting cited by the city. And then in 2009, when Skye was only two months old, they all went to Target. It was only 27 degrees outside, and they left him in the car while they went inside. Police had them paged to their car. The police asked them, why did you leave your baby in the car? And they said because he was sleeping and they didn't want to wake him up, which personally does not make any sense to me. If he's in that infant carrier, you could just carry him in and he could continue to sleep while you do your shopping also told police that they were only in there for 20 minutes, but when they look at the security footage, it's shown that they were in there for much longer. I mean, even 20 minutes, you can't just leave your baby in the car, let alone when it's cold. They were both then arrested, but they were released not long after this, and they agreed to take some parenting classes, so then they agreed to drop the charges. Then, in 2010, on Julia's 29th birthday, she tells Solomon that she had a dream that she killed the kids. She was then committed to a mental hospital for a short amount of time. Julia was diagnosed with severe OCD, but psychiatrists still felt as though she was a fit parent, so they ended up releasing her. Not long after she's released, her and Solomon actually end up filing for divorce. 
She kept texting Solomon saying that she was having suicidal ideations. She was then committed for a second time to a mental hospital where they ran a test and it said her global assessment of functioning was 15. The global assessment of functioning or GAF scale is used to rate how serious a mental illness may be. It measures how much a person's symptoms affect their day-to-day -day life on a scale of 0 to 100. Over time, her score went up to 40 and she was released. Julia then agreed to be checked into the University of Washington's Medical Center. Sadly, while she was there, their condo actually ended up being foreclosed on. So Solomon took both kids and they moved back in with his parents. Julia and Solomon also were going through a very rocky divorce. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of he said and she said happening. She said that he was abusive and that she feared for her life. He also brought up how Julia's OCD made it so him and the kids could not sleep in their beds and that there was no food allowed in the house. Then Solomon was accused of hurting their daughter. So it took CPS about a year to investigate this and during this whole time Solomon was not allowed to see their kids. Also during all this, they both tried to keep getting protective orders against each other. But in September of 2010, the court decided to give Julia full custody of the kids. She would not let Solomon see their kids, and it also said that he did not have any visitation rights. At one point, Julia offers to drop the alimony and child support if he agrees to let her and the kids move to Arizona. But he refused, and they continued to go back and forth for over a year. So in early November of 2011, the court ordered that they have a week-long mediation and they needed to resolve all their issues. So that was all the background information on what led up to Skye's disappearance. Now I'm going to get into the actual disappearance. It's the morning of November 6th of 2011 and both kids are at home with Julia. She says she wakes up and that Skye is very sick. So she says she gets both kids into her brother's silver two-door 1998 Acura Integra and they start driving to Overlake Medical Center in Bellevue, Washington. But while they're on the way to the hospital, they run out of gas. Julia then pulls the car over to the side of the road, where she leaves two-year-old Skye buckled in his car seat. She takes his four-year-old sister, Molly, with her. She leaves the car unlocked, and her and Molly walk a mile to the gas station to get more gas. But once they get there, she does not get any more gas. She calls a friend to bring her back to their car. This friend picks them up from the gas station and gives them a ride back to the, where the car was parked on the side of the road. When she gets there, she realizes that Skye is not in his car seat. So she calls police and reports him as missing. Authorities reached out to Solomon to let him know that Skye was missing. They began to search a 20 block radius around where the car was left, but they were not able to find anything. And when they tested Julia's car, it was found out that it was not out of gas and everything on it was running completely fine. They also learned that the car had been unlocked and they could see that there was no sign of forced entry. She did allow them to search her car, computer, and home, but she refused to take a lie detector test. Solomon agreed to take a lie detector test. It says that the test results were inconclusive though. He did allow them to search his house, but they were not able to find anything. Police then learned about when they had left Skye alone in 2009 in the car while they went into Target. They both admitted that there was multiple times that they left both kids alone. Witnesses that had drove past her car that morning also said that there was nothing out of the ordinary and they didn't even see a child inside the vehicle. When they questioned Molly, she did say that her brother was in the car, but she was only four years old and she easily could have been told by Julia or anyone to say that he was in the car. And I mean, maybe he really was, but she was so young. They also noticed that on Julia's Facebook page, she had all these different pictures of Molly, but hardly any of Skye. I think that this part is so crazy. So they did not ever charge Julia with any type of child endangerment, even though she was said to just have left this two-year-old in the car. They also have never said that she's a prime suspect or the prime person of interest. They said that if evidence ever showed up that Skye had been murdered or kidnapped, then authorities would arrest her. But until then, they are trying to build the best case against her that they can. They said that they did not want to arrest Julia because her and her attorney then would have time to go over all the evidence that had been built up to this point. 
Molly was taken from her mom's home and put into foster care. Solomon was granted twice weekly visits to see her. The divorce was granted in January of 2012 and Solomon was able to get custody of Molly. And in 2015, Julia remarried and actually had another child. Julia refuses to talk to authorities about her son's disappearance. So here are some possible theories of what happened to Skye. Police say they do not believe that Skye wandered away on his own, which I think is reasonable. There's, he's two, so if he's in the car seat, it's gonna be hard for him to unbuckle. Even that bottom part for me is hard to unbuckle, so I cannot imagine a two-year-old being able to do that and getting out of the vehicle and wandering off. They think if he is still alive that someone else took him or that she maybe even possibly did something to him before and that he wasn't even ever in the car. It was just an excuse to be able to report him missing and hopefully not get caught. Because once she realized that nobody believed the hospital story, she decided to hire a lawyer. Solomon believes that his son is still alive. He said that Julia's estranged father came to visit her and he believes that maybe he the father took Skye back to Ukraine with him. Solomon's attorney says that he does not believe that Skye was ever even in the car that morning and that since Julia was so obsessed with cleaning that she bleached her house and got rid of any type of evidence. But wow, what a crazy case. But I don't know, what do you think happened to Skye? I think it's most likely that Julia had something to do with his disappearance. What do all of you think happened to him? If you know anything, I will leave all the phone numbers down below where you can contact authorities. But thank you so much for watching today's video, and I will see you all next time. Bye.